Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Thais Rocha. I'm a postdoctoral research uh, at the University of Sao Paulo and now a departmental lecturer uh, at the same university and a research fellow at Harris Manchester University of Oxford. And I would like to welcome you all to our uh, last talk of the year. Uh, in our uh, Cyclogy Seminarios Mesalinas. Uh, we are a research group that work with uh, gender studies in Brazil. Um, we are coordinated and based on the University of Sao Paulo, we are coordinated by uh, Professor uh, Sara Azevedo, uh, who is a uh, lecturer in, the, in our history department. And, we are very happy to have you all here. We're very happy to have our guest, Dr. Udo Matic, with us. Uh, and just to give you uh, um, a background about our group, uh, we uh, are researchers from um, different universities in Brazil dealing with different uh, time periods, different societies, and we aim genuinely to collaborate um, in developing research about gender uh, in, ancient, in the ancient world. So for us, it's really a privilege to be able to uh, have Dr. Uh, Dr. Urosh Matic with us um, to talk a little bit about gender in ancient Egypt. And I will um, uh, ask uh, our uh, team to display uh, the information about uh, our website uh, in, the, um, in the bottom of our page. Uh, and I'm very happy now to introduce our guest uh, as I should. So Dr. Udo Matic is a research associate uh, of the Austrian Archaeological Institutes um, in the Austrian Academic of Science since 2019. He obtained his PhD in 2017 at the Institute for Egyptology and Coptic Studies of the University of Münster in Germany. For his PhD, he received a uh, the Philippka Prize of Harasowitz Publishing House in Germany in 2018 and Best Paper Award in 2020 uh, of the Austrian Academic of Science. Um, Dr. Machit was a DAD, a Prime Fellow and a Guest Researcher at the OEA Institute for Oriental and European Archaeology of the Austrian Academy of Science. Uh, from 2018 to 2019, and he has been working on several field projects in Egypt, uh, Tel El Daba, Aswan, and Komombo since 2012. His most recent publications include Body and Frames of War in New Kingdom, Egypt, Violent Treatment of Enemies and Prisoners uh, from 2019, sorry, uh, Ethnic Identities in the Land of the Pharaohs uh, by Cambridge University Press uh, last year, and Violence and Gender in Ancient Egypt, um, which is out in 2021. So I would like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uro Matic, and thank you so much for being with us today. It's really a pleasure. Thank you, thank you very much, Thais, for this wonderful introduction and announcement. I'm now going to share my screen and just please tell me um, something is now not working let me just check in the meanwhile urush i just would like to remind our uh, attendees today that uh, if you want to make uh, questions please feel free to uh, type in the chat and we'll have time for discussion after dr matic's presentation so can yeah, you please you tell me if you can see my first slide now and yes. if you can hear me well? Yes. Great. Great. It's uh, working. Once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Thais Rocha, for uh, uh, introducing me uh, tonight or today in Brazil. And I would also like to express my enormous gratitude to University of Sao Paulo and Primeiro ciclo de seminarios mesalinas grupo de estudos sobre género e sexualidade na antigüedade. I really hope I, I did uh, this well now in Portuguese. And also I would like to thank uh, next to Thais Rocha, uh, Isabella uh, Torres and Diego Leitch uh, for organizing this uh, 
lecture tonight. I'm really glad to be here. I'm trying to um, do this lecture in a semi-formal way because, uh, as I understood, um, the participants of the seminar received one of my published texts to discuss, and um, the lecture is more or less following the structure of this text, which was published uh, quite recently in the UCLA Encyclopedia for Egyptology. And uh, before I start, I would also like to give you a, a, a short context. Uh, I'm very happy that Thais invited me to speak about this topic since we met uh, each other in 2016 in uh, Krakow at CRE, Current Research in Egyptology. And this is where I realized that there are more people out there interested in theoretical archaeology and gender studies. And I'm really glad that since then I can call Thais not only my colleague, but also my friend. So without further delay, my topic tonight is engendering ancient Egyptian and Nubian war discourse. And this is a short overview of topics I'm going to discuss with you. So I'm going to cover Egyptology and gendered language. Then I'm going to talk about gender as a frame of war. Uh, this is going to serve as a kind of a theoretical background of my lecture. And after that, I'm going to go into the case studies and the material itself, uh, discussing about feminization of enemies in ancient Egyptian texts and iconography, feminization of enemies in ancient Nubian texts. And then I'm going to discuss the curious case of Meroe in these regards and offer a conclusion. So let us start with the first topic tonight, and this is Egyptology and gendered language. So in order for us to deal with this topic on a, a common ground, so to say, we all have to, uh, let's say, agree about some uh, basic terms. And uh, first of them is that we have to differentiate between sex, which are biological differences in genes, chromosomes, hormones, and anatomy and gender, which will be the social cultural interpretation of sexual differences. And gender is only one facet of identity next to, for example, status, class, ethnicity, sexuality, and so on and so forth. Of course, this distinction between sex, sex and gender has been questioned already in the 90s in the work of the third uh, feminist wave and queer theory. Um, but uh, even if we disagree with this questioning of the normativity and naturality of sex, we have to agree on the term that uh, biological differences in a human culture are always already interpreted and associated with meanings, as Judith Butler uh, wrote in her book, Bodies That Matter from 1993, uh, materiality is bound up with signification from the start. And this leads us then to a gender system, which would be social cultural ordering of different genders regarding status, hierarchy, occupation, rights, etc. And then we come to gender archaeology and gender studies in history, historiography. These are subfields dealing with gender in past societies, modern prejudices, androcentrism, heteronormativity, etc. So this is a very short summary, a digest version of a vast field of knowledge about gender I'm sure most of the listeners tonight are aware of. But how does it look in Egyptology? Well, of course, in Egyptology, focus has been traditionally on a man because uh, traditionally, until more or less recently, most Egyptologists were uh, high or middle class white cis heterosexual men from Europe or the Western world. Um, and then only later on did Egyptology start to also criticize androcentrism of its discipline and to focus more on women. 
we can say that the interest for women uh, came even before criticism of androcentrism. For example, Stefan Wenig uh, wrote Die Frau im Alten Ägypten, uh, Woman in Ancient Egypt, already in 1967. But in 1993, so at the beginning of the 19th and later, serious questioning of androcentrism started, and we have more publications focusing on women. For example, uh, Women in Ancient Egypt by Gay Robbins, or the catalog edited vol volume Mistress of the House, Mistress of Heaven, Women in Ancient Egypt. And then in the late 90s, we have the introduction of the third feminist wave thinking and queer theory uh, in, in uh, Egyptology and the introduction of intersectionality thinking uh, with the book of Lynn Maskell, Archaeologies of Social Life, where she examined gender in a um, crisscross, let's say, with status, class, sexuality, and so on. But what about language? Well, already at the beginning of 2000s, first studies appeared which studied gender in ancient Egyptian texts. Specifically, I'm referring to one example being the study of uh, Professor Deborah Sweeney, uh, and this is Gender in Contendings of Horus and Set from Journal of Egyptian Archaeology. And of course, numerous studies followed after that with different theoretical backgrounds, but it seems that this plain focus solely on women in ancient Egypt uh, uh, continues in, in Egyptology even until quite recently. And I would like to stress that studying women in ancient Egypt or dealing with women in Egyptology uh, can be related to gender studies but it is not necessarily so. As we have seen, gender studies are something else. Gender studies are about gender relations, about gender dynamics, about understanding of how does a woman or a man come to be in a specific society. And now I'm jumping to a completely different field of research within Egyptology, and that is studies of violence and war specifically of war. And as you can see here, different studies appeared in the last few decades dealing with pharaohs smiting the enemies, but also military rank and or the organization of the Egyptian military, ceremonial execution, ritual violence, weapons, uh, equipment, uh, representations of battles and violence, and so on and so forth. However, none of these dealt with women or gender. And we cannot say that this subfield of Egyptology is a boys club, so to say, because there are a lot of women researching on these topics, but gender was not on the agenda. And there are only few exceptions. So I'm now referring to the volume structure and significance where Professor David O'Connor uh, wrote a contribution dealing with uh, the sexualized background of the iconography of Medinet Habu temple of Ramses III. But also uh, 2017 appeared a study by Shiva Su, Builder for the Pharaoh, which deals with figurative language in Egyptian texts and imagery. And this is where Shiva Su also uh, collected some of the sources in which enemies are uh, represented in a way metaphorically or metonymically as women. And this is where we come to the possibility of combining these two areas of studies, namely studies of women and gender in ancient Egypt, or gender studies cross-culturally, and studies of war and violence in ancient Egypt. And my idea tonight is to um, combine these two fields of research with a background called frame of war, where I'm going to use gender as a frame of war. What does that mean? So already in 1991, French uh, philosopher Jean Baudrillard uh, wrote uh, a book called The Gulf War Never Happened. Uh, of course, he didn't want to say with this title that the Gulf War never happened. Uh, he wanted to point to something else. That is, at in this moment uh, when war gets turned into media, be that textual media, 
or visual media, such as photography or movies, it stops being real and it becomes virtual. What does that mean is that the reality of war is being filtered through media. And then in 2009, or first 2006 and then 2009, another scholar from the field of philosophy now in the States, Judith Butler, very well known for her theory of performativity of gender, uh, continued on uh, her trail of gender research by examining the media of war in the United States and how exactly um, our reports of war in Iraq framed and uh, which filters are being used in order to report on war and how certain lives which are lost in war have more value than other lives which are equally lost in war. And gender plays uh, a very important role here. And she continues on this line in her book, The Force of Nonviolence from uh, 2020. So following uh, Judith Butler and previously uh, Jean Baudrillard, we can also ask the question, well, uh, how were ancient Egyptian media, meaning texts and images of war, filtered, if they were filtered, and what do they communicate, and what is left out? By understanding what is communicated and what is left out, we are able to understand the frames of war better, and we are able to understand the gender as the frame of war better in ancient Egypt. Well, now this maybe sounds all too theoretical, but let me remind you that this is very close to some of the thinking which already existed in Egyptology, and it was maybe not called frame of war, but it is a very similar concept. Namely, this is the concept of decorum defined by British Egyptologist Professor John Baines, and he defined decorum as a set of rules and practices defining what may be represented pictorially with captions displayed and possibly written down in which context and in what form. And isn't this very similar to the idea of the frames of war? So there is a force at work behind organizing what is being written, where is it being written, who is able to see that, who is able to read that, who is able to understand that. And this ordering is something we can analyze in, in ancient uh, Egyptian sources. And now just as a connection to the previous uh, definitions of gender and frame of war, I would also like to remind you that there have been cross-cultural studies on gender which argue that relations between political enemies stand for relations between men and women. And this is a thought I would like to leave you with now and now go into the concept of gender as a violent thing. Well, what does that mean? It actually means that Yes, we are born into certain bodily forms and we have to meet certain expectations of our gender, whether we are men or women. But if we do not manage to do this, at least if we fail to do this according to these norms, there are social forces at work which are there to remind us that we are doing something wrong, maybe by walking too feminine on the street and we are men, or by wearing short hair and looking too masculine for a lady, and so on and so forth. So maybe we sometimes get a warning which is verbal, so someone says something to us, something like you are a lesbian or you're a gay man, you're a fag, you should be killed, and so on and so forth. Or we are being physically attacked and punished and violently forced to get back into the norm, to respect the norm. And of course, 
this does not have to be a form of physical or verbal violence. It can also be a symbolic violence because we see images of what is normal all around us. We see this in the media. We see this on the streets. We see other people respecting the norms. So that is why in 2017, a colleague of mine, Bo Jensen from Copenhagen, Denmark, who is a specialist in Scandinavian medieval archaeology and the Viking era, we co-edited uh, a volume called Archaeologies of Gender and Violence, where we argued that gender culture is a violent culture and forced through acts and threats of violence, both physical, verbal, and symbolic. And this is the idea I then followed in my PhD and in my most recent publication, which Thais mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, where I combined these ideas with ancient Egyptian material and tonight I'm going to represent uh, some of the results. So let us start now with my first case study, and that is feminization of enemies in ancient Egyptian texts and iconography. This overview is not going to focus on one very specific period or place in Egypt. Since we do not have this material in abundance, I'm going to give you certain nice examples. So let's start with the first one. This is a battle scene from a private tomb of the Old Kingdom, Inti, tomb in the Shasha. And what you can see here is the Egyptian army. I hope you can see the cursor now moving on the screen. So the Egyptian army is on the left fighting men what, what, who seem to be um, foreigners, which Egyptologists tend to call Asiatics. Uh, this is a very wrong uh, term, and nowadays uh, we know um, which Orientalist connotations this term has, but we know that according to how these men are dressed, they must come from Syria, Palestine, and they are fighting, or actually they are losing in the fight with Egyptian soldiers. As you, as you can see here, all of them are being killed, and they are not particularly active against uh, Egyptian soldiers. So they are losing outside. But what is going on inside this fort is that you can see here in the first register above, we see women and children. And one of these women is fighting an Egyptian soldier. And then in the second register, we see an, another group of women and children but also elderly men holding a, a stick or a staff and being a little bit bound next to a child here, and a woman holding for her hair like she's um, ripping a piece of uh, her hair uh, out of her head. And this is something also done uh, by the seated man here, probably someone in charge of this fort, and then we see some very damaged scenes again of fighting and uh, these foreign women are taking part in this. So what I'm aiming here at is, doesn't it seem as if we have a contrast of active men of Egyptian origin, Egyptian soldiers actively being violent against passive foreign men who are losing, and this is in contrast to active foreign women, in a way, taking over the role of men as protectors and fighters, fighting against um, Egyptian soldiers who are storming this fort and entering inside. In a way, this image is telling us they are so weak that their women, their elderly, have to defend them they have to take on the roles which are meant for proper men like the Egyptian soldiers. So now we have here a visual idea of what is an ideal masculinity form in war. And of course, at the very end here in this register, we see these foreign men and women and children being taken as prisoners of war to Egypt. Also note, this motive of holding for the hair is a motive of grief, of mourning, of loss. So the whole idea is the enemy is defeated, the enemy is suffering loss, the enemy is like a crying woman, the enemy is like the widow. <laughs> 
And now the next example I would like to show you is later. It comes from the 11th dynasty tomb of Inter from, from Thebes. And here we have similar scene of Egyptian soldiers storming uh, a fort from Syria, Palestine. But instead of going here into details, I want you to have a look at this last two registers over here where you can see Egyptian soldiers not only taking uh, men, women, and children as prisoners of war away, but they're also acting violently towards these women. You can see here this Egyptian soldier is holding for the hair of the Egyptian woman, and a child next to her is looking at this scene. So we have to bear in mind that the reality of war um, is something traumatic for different people and that non-combatants such as women and children suffer the most from this. And you can see here also how these foreign men are depicted nude. And I would also like you to bear in mind the fact, maybe it's not so visible here, but it is in the original, that you can see their penises, of course, not in erection, so completely in contrast to the ideal image of direct phallus in ancient Egypt. And also here, an Egyptian soldiers kind of either hitting the woman on her head or holding her for her head. So this was the iconography. And I'm going to give you some examples from the texts, which are equally interesting in my opinion. And they're also equally indicative of gender as a frame of war. One of the most famous examples for feminization in a way or passivization of enemies in ancient Egyptian texts are the Semna and Uranati stele of Senusa III. So let me remind you, these two sites, Semna and Uranati, are actually located in Lower Nubia, and these were Egyptian military forts. The stele I'm talking about were located in the forts, and you can see here the location of the Semna stele. And before, uh, before I go into the text and the details, I would simply like you to bear in mind the idea that there are Egyptian soldiers there and there is this stila there. And wouldn't it be so strange to imagine that soldiers being there are communicated with this stila by people who can read, such as scribes or priests. They are reading them this text. And what did this text actually contain? Well, a sort of a rhetoric text about the defeat of Nubia by the king of Egypt, by the pharaoh, Senusa III. And in this text, we have uh, mentioning of taking Nubian women imprisonment, and the verb used is the verb hak, to plunder, to take spoils of war. But also there is a line which is very interesting and which says, aggression is bravery, retreat is wild. He who is driven from his boundary is a true hem. Of course, the referent here is the Nubian man who is defeated. And what does hem mean? Well, various Egyptologists discussed the meaning of this word and different translations have been offered. For example, uh, homosexual, passive homosexual man, pansy, uh, passive man, feminine man, and so on and so forth. Clearly, there is a connection between the word hemet, woman, and hem, whatever hem means, but it also is determined with the phallus determinative. So we know that hem is a masculine noun. So it is someone who is like a woman, but also like a man who is showing his back. And why is this uh, so? Well, Professor Richard Parkinson indicated that the word itself derives from the verb hemi, to repel, to uh, retreat. So in a way to show back. So. This is, in a way, a passivization of the Nubian uh, enemy who is turning his back, who is doing something which is not supposed to be done by a soldier. 
And that, there is another example, which is maybe not so convincing. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. It is a stila of Usatate, Ur Viceroy of Nubia, from the reign of Amenhotep II of the 18th dynasty. And there we have a description of the Egyptian pharaoh, which says that he is the lord of a female servant from Babylon, a female servant from Byblos, a little girl from Alalach, and an old woman from Arabha. So all of these um, words in Egyptian are in feminine uh, gender. However, in the text itself, all of these words, female servant from Babylon, uh, female servant from Byblos, little girl from Alalach, and old woman from Arabha, are actually determined with signs for men and not for women. The question is, why didn't they use the determinative for women for the nouns which are clearly feminine in gender? For example, Sejumet Ash and Keben, female servant from Biblos, uh, Mesut Sherit, a uh, little girl from Alalach, Irerech, and Iait, old woman from Irepech. And there is a suggestion maybe that we are dealing with, in a way, feminization of the rulers of Babylon, Biblos, and Alalach, and Arabcha. So in a way, this text is not referring to a real female servant or a little girl or an old woman. These are old, all, all words used to, in a way, lower down the rulers of uh, these countries. But if you're not convinced by that, let's go to some other more direct examples. So, for example, in Komel Achma West Delta Stila of Meremtach, also known as the Atribi Stila, and located, as you can see, uh, in the Western uh, Delta here, we have the description of the nine bows, traditional enemies of Egypt, as being before the king, like women of the harem. The word used here in original is henerit, which is the woman of the harem. Harem is henna. And please do not associate this to this Orientalist notion of the harem or the Ottoman version of the harem. In ancient Egypt, this is a completely different institution with a strong economical background, uh, of course, related to, to women, but it should not be imagined as this Orientalist harem. For me, the meaning of this word in the specific context is not so important. For me, the fact that nine bows are compared to women before the king is the most important aspect. But then there is another example. I already mentioned to you the grieving or the mourning women of Syria, Palestine, losing against Egyptian soldiers. And then millennia later, we have the triumph hymn of Meremta on his Israel stila, where Syria is described as becoming a widow because of Egypt. So Syria became a widow because of Egypt. And note here the pan, haret, widow, and haru, Syria. This is surely not a coincidence. And then we move to another example from the already mentioned Medid Habu temple of Ramses III, where it is said that he, the king, is looking at bowmen like women, meaning Bowman Nubians, who are like women for him. And Libyan enemies are described as being made limp or spread out on the ground. And then curiously, the determinative for these uh, words uh, being made limp or spread out on the ground is a woman delivering a baby. And um, it is very interesting, actually, that this metaphor of childbirth for crisis has its evidence in ancient Near East and Neo Assyrian records, but also in Hebrew Bible, where enemies are compared to women in childbirth simply because women in childbirth are in a state of uh, precarity, insecurity, weakness. So it is not uh, um, it is not strange that uh, this image is used as a metaphor for a weak or enemy who is in a state of precarity. And actually, uh, we have here examples which predate the ancient Near Eastern and biblical uh, evidence for, for centuries. We already have them in 12th century BCE in Egypt.
And now turning to iconography, these enemies who are turning their backs and leaving the battlefield and they are losing, uh, this continues, of course, uh, into the new kingdom. However, here we also see uh, defeated, injured Nubian soldiers returning to their village, children informing people of the village about the incoming uh, either uh, defeated, injured, or diseased Nubian men. And as you can see here, there is a small figure of a Nubian boy who holds um, his uh, pal he holds palm of his hand on his forehead. And this is something we know from Egyptian uh, representations of grief and mourning in scenes of uh, grief and mourning from private tombs. And this is something we also find in the Temple of Dero, Ramses II. Again, we see here an injured, defeated, or fallen Nubian soldier who is being carried by his comrades. And then we see here boys and girls mourning. So the idea is that the whole village is in grief. And since this specific motive of holding the palm of the hand on the forehead is something which is in iconography of uh, Egypt, more related to women, we are maybe also dealing with a form of a feminization of Nubian boys uh, through this motive. In a sense, they are acting like whining, crying little girls. But this has also some very uh, specific consequences. And it is possible that the cutting of the folly of Libyan enemies is also, uh, is also related to uh, this notion of gender as a frame of war. I already mentioned at the beginning in the case uh, of the tomb of Intef that imprisoned enemy men are depicted with their penises uh, um, flaccid and not in erection, and that this is contrasting to this ideal notion of an erect penis in ancient Egypt, of which we all know. But this is something we also find later on, centuries later on in Medinet Habu, where, as you can see here, Libyan enemies are depicted, first of all, with some of the hands cut off, and as you can see, they are still living and breathing and looking at their missing hands. So at least in iconography, we have an indication that hands were cut off from people while they were still alive. And this is one of the main arguments in my PhD. And now going back to the folly, we never have the depiction of cutting off the folly we only have the cut of folly or penises being counted by Egyptian soldiers, and they look exactly like the penises when they are still attached to the enemy bodies or the Libyan bodies. And in texts, these members are described as Henenu, Henenu and Keranet, or simply lexicalized as Keranet. All of these words are different Egyptian words for the penis. So there is no question that what was cut off here was a penis and not a piece of clothing the Libyans were wearing as some of the authors suggested. But now why is this important? Well, we talked about discursive feminization of enemies. So when texts refer to enemies from Syria, Palestine or Nubia as women or widows, and so on and so forth. These are metaphors and metonyms. These are discursive feminizations. When we have this in imagery, we are also dealing with a form of a visual discourse. But this is something else. This is an actual practice in war. This is a practice of mutilation of the enemy. And let me now remind you of a text known as the Tale of Two Brothers, in which the younger brother, Bata, in one moment, in order to prove his innocence to his brother, he wanted to prove that he did not rape his wife, he cuts off his penis. And later on in the story, this younger brother who lost his penis, he remarries. And his wife and him are having a discussion and he says to his wife, don't go out because he's afraid she will be taken by the sea. 
And then she asks why, and he said, because I'm a woman like you. So this loss of penis is in a way loss of masculinity. So returning back to the contemporary data from Meremta Ramses III, more or less uh, contemporary data to the tale of two brothers, aren't we actually looking at uh, physical feminization of enemies in the process? And how does it look when those who are women and rule Egypt treat their enemies? First examples, um, first example I'm going to show now is from Hatshepsut from Deir al Bahari, where she is in the form of a male sphinx, yet she is trampling over male enemies. Of course, the scene is very damaged. But there are no indications that there are any women here. On, there are also no indications that the Sphinx itself is in a feminine form. Something completely different is found in the tomb of Keroef from the reign of Amenhotep III, where Amenhotep III and Tie are depicted in a kiosk and they are sitting on their thrones. And as you can see here on the throne of Queen Tie, she is depicted trampling enemies, one Nubian, one Syrian, but both of these are women, and they are also depicted in, of course, female form, tied to a Sematawi sign. For what are we dealing with here? Well, these images are a direct parallel to the throne of the king himself, Amenhotep III, from the tomb of Amenemhat Surah Titi 48, where he's also in the form of the Sphinx. However, he is trampling male enemies. So again, for comparison, this is, so to say, a feminine version of what we have here, the masculine version. So when talking about iconography, we find Egyptian queens hurting enemies, these enemies are always women. And this is very important to remember and note because I'm going to come back to this shortly. This continues also in the Amarna period during the reign of Akhenaten, where Nefertiti is found smiting and trampling over enemies who are also female. But how did Egyptologists interpret this so far? So some are examples, some of the examples are listed here. I'm going to read them because I think they're really interesting and they tell us a lot about how perception of these images can change over time and how different theoretical perspectives can change our view of the data. So Kuni already wrote in 1965, the famous and beautiful Nefertiti is shown in that traditional pose of Egyptian kings the vanquisher of foreign enemies of Egypt. If we are to take the scene at its face value, Nefertiti must have been a forceful and energetic woman who held power at least equal to her husband's. Her striking but cold beauty and her apparent meddling in affairs of state are currently reminiscent of the similar beauty and political interference of the last Serena of Russia. Well, Yes, interesting. However, as we have seen, we can't really say that based on this imagery, Nefertiti held power at least equal to her husband because, as we have seen, she does not trample over and she does not smite male enemies, just as the king is not smiting or hurting female enemies. So there is a hierarchy there, and I would not interpret Nefertiti acting violently against female enemies as being a form of iconographic equality. And then, of course, the interpretations continue. So Wilson wrote in 1973, such scenes of power and terror on the cabins of boats or on kiosks are elsewhere restricted to kings or gods. She, meaning Nefertiti, thus showed her independent power. Well, not really, because in all of these scenes, uh, Nefertiti is found doing the same thing as the king. The only difference is 
her version is the female version, just as in the case of Tia. And then again, we have an interesting quote saying, Nefertiti followed him, meaning Akhenaten, faithfully and was herself depicted in distortion. A beautiful woman must have been devoted to the new movement to permit such a perversion of her grace. And now we have this idea of women acting violently actually perverse their grace. They are acting outside of the norm. In a way, it is inimaginable that a woman is depicted acting violently. But it is not unimaginable in popular culture because I will remind you shortly of the music video for the song Remember the Time of Michael Jackson where the king is named Ramses, but of course the inspiration for her for his wife for the queen of egypt in this uh, fictional ancient egypt in the video uh, is the bust of nefertiti from berlin which actually appears at the beginning of the video and in this video this fictional queen fictional nefertiti is portrayed by somalian supermodel iman mohammed abdul mahid and in this video she is killing one entertainer after the other because she is not happy with uh, her husband and she's bored. And this idea of women acting violently uh, out of uh, loss of love or lack of uh, love is something we actually have continuously in popular culture. And I would just like to remind you of the most recent Game of Thrones and the last episode, I think, where we have these outbursts of Daenerys Targaryen killing everyone in front of her just because she didn't have love of her husband. So this is where we see how popular ideas of gender, female hysteria inherited already from 19th century psychoanalysis are fused with popular culture and how they can even influence the minds of Egyptologists. And ultimately, we have a reconstruction of Nefertiti smiting or slaughtering enemies with a sickle-shaped sword in a National Geographic documentary, Nefertiti Revealed. However, the mistake here is that the enemies in the movie are male and not female. And this gives us a completely different impression. And this sends a completely different uh, message to those who are not Egyptologists and uh, who we are supposed to be educating through such informative documentaries. And now, since I'm already slowly at the end of my presentation, and I have only 12 more minutes, I'm going to switch to uh, the next topic, and this is the feminization of enemies in ancient Nubian texts, simply to compare them to what we have in Egyptian evidence and to see if we have similarities and differences, sim since we tend to treat Nubia as, of course, an independent uh, culture. So, um, Already, Matthias Carlson in 2020 pointed to the gender background of not only the texts, but also of the iconography of the triumphal stela of Pierre, who was the founder of the 25th dynasty, mid 8th century BC. And as you can see here, very interestingly, the princes of Lower Delta are doing a proskinesis to King Pie, and they are depicted a little bit too curvy for men in Egyptian iconography, but they are perfectly curvy for Egyptian and Nubian women in iconography. And also note here that the wife of the enemy of King Pie is in front of her husband. She is a larger figure. So I'm now reminding you of this classical Egyptolog Egyptological notion of hierarchy of scaling, uh, 
or Bedeutungsmaßstab in German, where the bigger figures in Egyptian iconography are usually the more prominent or the more important ones. So it is the wife of the king who is in front of the king, and the king is smaller, and he holds a sistrum. And sistrum is usually associated to priestesses of Hatho and Egyptian women. So what are we seeing here? We are seeing a gender inversion. Defeated Egyptian king is acting like a woman, and his wife is acting like a man. The idea is something must be wrong with this family. And then we have the same in texts. So in one part of the text, this text states quite clearly, now these kings and counts of Lower Egypt came to behold his majesty's beauty, their legs being the legs of women. And then we have another part of the text saying, you return, meaning the king of Nubia returns, having conquered Lower Egypt, making bulls into women. As we know, bulls are in ancient Egypt and Nubia regularly associated to masculinity. And in this particular context, bulls maybe stand as a metaphor for men who are then, as a consequence of loss in war, turned into women. But what do we do with the legs of women described here or the legs of enemies, the legs of uh, these kings and counts of Lower Egypt described as being the legs of women? Well, various authors suggested various interpretations. One of these interpretations was that they were probably shaving their legs like women. But in my opinion, this is a very modernist view of uh, female body and how does a female body supposed to look like and how are, how are women supposed to treat their bodily hair. So this is in a way a transference of a modern idea onto the past. Um, of course, we know that both men and women shaved in ancient Egypt and Nubia, and that they also tended to remove uh, bodily hair, especially the elite. So there was no clear, clear gender difference there, at least according to the finds we have from tombs, where razors are regularly associated to both men and women. But there is an interesting comparison, and that is the Old Testament, namely in Isaiah 18.2, we have a description of Nubians, of the Kushites. They are tall people and they are smooth skinned. Does that mean that they shave their bodily hair? If that means that, then we can't say that what bothered these men were shaved legs of their enemies. This is maybe better to think about this in a different way. Maybe their legs were the legs of women metaphorically because the text simply wanted to indicate the weakness of these enemies. Now, another example is from the Annals of Hasiutef, who was a Meritic king who likely ruled in the first third of the fourth century BC. And in this text, quite interestingly, something we do not have in Egyptian material, this Meritic king uh, is of course describing his victories but in one part of the text his enemy the Medadet chief who is reduced to a spoil of war speaks himself and he himself says to the king Harsiutef you are my god I am your servant I am a woman come to me so not only that we have here a hierarchy where he identifies himself as a servant of the Meritic king, but we also have this idea that hierarchy is related to gender. So in a way, being a servant for this Meritic king means being like a woman for him. And what does that tell us about the background of this society and how did it understand gender relations, both in Egypt and Nubia, is, in my opinion, very indicative. But then we have to come to the case of Meroe and to the end of my presentation. Well, I showed you previously the cases where Egyptian rulers who are female, such as Hatshepsut uh, or queens, 
such as Tia and Nefertiti, are acting violently. The difference being that Hatshepsut, as a female king, uh, depicted herself, as we know, very often as the male pharaoh. And the only way we identify her as Hatshepsut in these cases is because we have her name and titles in feminine uh, gender. But she is, in these scenes, trampling or smiting male enemies, as a pharaoh does. But when a female uh, queen is doing this, not as a ruler of Egypt, but as the great royal wife of the pharaoh, such as Tia and Nefertiti, they are hurting only female enemies and not male enemies. So we cannot say that there is a form of equality there. Actually, rather the contrary, we have a gender structure related to hierarchy of uh, power relations and status. But Meroe is a different case. Why? Because in Meroe, reminder to those who are following us online and who maybe do not know, Meroe is a Nubian uh, state of uh, first uh, late first millennium uh, BC and uh, uh, first uh, millennium AD. Um, and its center was in uh, Meroe, the capital of the kingdom. And here we have uh, the pylon of the temple of Naga. Uh, sorry, this is not the pylon temple of Naga, my mistake. This is the pylon of the pyramid Begravia North 6, the burial of Amanishaketo. Naka will come uh, shortly where this Meroitic queen, but actually a ruler, is spearing male enemies, something we do not have in Egypt. Then we have Shanakdeto sitting on a throne under which we have actually enemies bound to each other, and they are also male. And then we come to Temple of Naga, I already mentioned, where we have Natakamani and Amanitore, who rule together over Meroe, smiting enemies, and these enemies are male. So why is this possible? And why is this possible in my opinion? Well, in my opinion, the difference here is related to how did Meroids actually understood rulership. For them, it was not a problem for a female being to rule as an equal, equal ruler to a male uh, king. And it was also not a problem for them for a single ruler to be female and has have control of the entire country. And this is something we also know from external sources, such as, for example, Strabo's geography, where we know that the Romans referred to the ruler of Meroe as Kandake, and this is a, a local title. So this is, in my opinion, the reason why Meroitic female rulers are allowed to be depicted trampling, smiting, or spearing male enemies, because we are not dealing with the same gender structure of rulership as in Egypt. And now this leads me to my conclusion and the very end of this presentation. So as we have seen, enemies in ancient Egyptian texts are feminized through metaphors or metonyms. So enemy men are passive men or women or harem women and widows. We also have pans or panomasias. Syria, Haru is like a widow, Haret. And in in Nubian texts, we have metaphors or metonyms for Nubian enemies, which are sometimes similar to those which we had in Egypt and sometimes different. For example, legs of enemies are as legs of women, something we do not have in Egyptian texts, but enemies are depicted as women or as servants or servants as, uh, of, of, as women. Going into question of is this a metaphor or a metonym is not important for this lecture. But what is important is that framing enemies as women or women like implicates and justifies the asymmetrical relations of power in the gender system of Egypt and Nubia.
And we, as we have seen, this is also confirmed by iconography or smiting of the enemies. To repeat again, a female ruler or a female uh, consort of the king is never depicted hurting male enemies, only females, and only in the same scenes, in a sense, um, complementing what the king is doing. So these presented metaphors and metonyms are associations based on a patriarchal masculinist discourse, which frames both enemy men, passive men and women as in weak and in need of protection. So we have a series of binary oppositions. We have actors and victims of violence. Actors of violence are active, victims of violence are passive. Actors of violence are behind of passive, just like in depictions of sex in ancient Egypt, very often, but the victims are in front of active. The actors are penetrating, the victims are penetrated, both in text and iconography. Actors are strong, victims of violence are weak. Actors of violence can be Egyptian men, but then they are hurting Egyptian women and foreigners, both men and women, although this changes over time, in iconography at least, but in texts, no. But we also have actors such as Egyptian women, great royal wives, queens, but then their victims are foreign women. So again, this confirms this idea that there is a gender structure, that there is gender as a frame of war, and that it is based on patriarchy. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to questions and discussion. Thank you so much, Urosh. It was absolutely fascinating. Um, I just uh, want to add that uh, I am particularly very happy that uh, for this year we started uh, this uh, seminar um, cycle with uh, Agnes Garcia Ventura, the beginning, and we are finishing with now with uh, an Egyptologist. So for someone studying uh, Egypt, uh, it's quite good to have our uh, colleagues and friends uh, dealing with the with, with Africa and the ancient Near East um, for that. Um, thank you. It was uh, fascinating. Uh, very um, a lot of um, food for thought. Um, but I'm just trying to uh, see if we have questions in the chat. So uh, for everyone. Um, attending uh, this uh, lecture, please feel free to write your questions uh, in the chat. If you're not comfortable with your English, um, please write in Portuguese and we'll make sure uh, it will be translated. Um, I would like to highlight something that was um, interesting and it came up in the discussion we had in the um, research group last week, uh, how uh, the gender system in ancient Egypt is is binary, and sometimes we we see some uh, studies that push to something very modern, very um, uh, liberating, and they project that to to ancient Egyptian society. Of course, uh, compromising completely the the um, emic understanding of uh, the sources. So based on that comment, um, I was um, remembering from the discussion, we have people in, in our group in Mesalinas dealing with uh, violence in many uh, different societies. So um, people studying war, people studying domestic violence. Uh, and one thing that really uh, call my attention in your presentation this time is how this asymmetric relation of power can be easily perceived in Egypt uh, and we can uh, establish clear parallels with Roman society, with uh, Greek descriptions uh, of wars, uh, but traditionally the historiographies, the scholarship in Egyptology tended to present Egypt as um, somehow a peaceful people, uh, not interested in um, matters of violence or war. And so there, there was a certain, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying that because we have um, a lot of people uh, listening to us from Brazil that 
have no access to this uh, material. So if you could expand a little bit this, um, let's say, idealized image of ancient Egypt uh, of, you know, uh, some sort of uh, esoteric, uh, peaceful people. Yes. And what you showed us <laughs> today was striking the opposite. Because um, I think it would be interesting to develop. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, both actually questions. First was about binary and asymmetrical relations of power. And then the other one was about this ingrained image of Egypt as a peaceful society, not concerned with violence and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't want to be rude here, but I'm simply going to uh, grab one of the books I want to read from to give you uh, a, a more, um, let's say, a fuller answer to the to the second question. Okay. And I'm going to start first, as I'm looking for this quote I want to, to read uh, about. Um, first, concerning the binary. Well, as, as I have shown in this presentation, at least in the context of war, the situation is quite binary. So you are either active actor of violence or you are a passive victim of violence. And therefore you are either a man acting violently against foreign men and women, or you are uh, an Egyptian woman acting violently against foreign women. So again, even when we have, let's say, same sex, violent binary opposition, namely Egyptian women, foreign women, we still have a binary opposition because the first group is active in violence and the other one is passive in violence. So in this particular case, this is an asymmetrical relation of power. And as you yourself said, this is very important. Why? Because uh, there is a tendency in scholarship to say that compared to other Eastern Mediterranean or Near Eastern societies, Egyptian women had a better position in the society, which concerning uh, rights to land, inheritance, and so on and so forth might be true, but that does not mean that they were equal to men. And this is something we should not forget. And where do we have a proof of that? So clearly in war, we have, in the discourse of war, an asymmetrical relations of power. Egyptian men, Egyptian soldiers are stronger, better, more successful than foreign soldiers. But in order to present this, they're using metaphors of male-female relations. But doesn't that actually tell us that male-female relations are asymmetrical? Simply because we have a simile. You're using something you know from your home to communicate an image or an, or an idea which is going to be understood by everyone. And uh, yeah, I'm coming to um, this quote now. So um, yes, the idea you said was that there is no, poss there is no possible way that uh, Egyptians were violent, at least not, not your idea, but the idea that is ingrained in scholarship. And now I would like to um, read a quote from um, a text by William uh, A. Ward, who reviewed the book of Alan Richard Schulman, uh, I mentioned in my presentation, and this is uh, uh, the book about executions in ancient Egypt, based on the depictions of smiting of the enemy motive on the private uh, stele. And so, uh, of course, Schulman is uh, writing in his study how he views these scenes of violence and what they actually meant and how they are representations of reality. And uh, Void is answering in a review, and now I'm quoting. He is, and now the quote starts, not very comfortable with the idea that representations on private stele of the king slaying captives reflect a reality. And then he, in the text, admitted his reluctance to Schulman, but uh, he says that 
why he disagrees is because Egyptians being violent is something which is not fitting there. And again, I quote, Egyptian national character. And then he continues, violence is something you can expect of the Assyrians, but not of the Egyptians. And this idea stayed in scholarship, I think, until 80s, 90s even. So there is plenty of evidence to contradict that. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Thank you so much, Urush. Uh, very just checking if there are more questions. No. Uh, I, I have, uh, I will continue to, <laughs> to, uh, bothering you with my um, very specific Egyptological questions here. <laughs> so one thing that um, I, I found really interesting is the way you explore the concept of uh, agency. Uh, because we, in the way you describe you know, men and women being active or, or passive, um, how, do you, how do you see that um, you, you gave examples, I'm just trying to rephrase here my notes. Uh, you gave examples from Nubia and from Egypt, uh, and you highlighted the difference in how these people understood a rulership and how they um, combine gender uh, stereotypes, let's put this way. So uh, how, how agency can be a, an interesting concept from, you know, let's say an anthropological point of view uh, to understand this uh, type of material, especially in uh, the diversity of sources we have. Um... This is an interesting question because I didn't I didn't frame this with the word agency, but yes, we can we can go into this direction. In my opinion, the tomb of Inti I showed at the beginning from the Old Kingdom, the Fifth Dynasty tomb of Inti, where we have the storming of the Syro-Palestinian fort, as you mentioned, in which we find foreign women taking over the role of men defending the fort. So in a way, they are having the agency, which is being taken away from the foreign men who do not have agency since they are being killed in the scene. This is an interesting twist. So agency here is something which is manipulated by the Egyptian artists for the context of this scene. So it is something which is in a way given to one group and taken from the other. Of course, the problem we have is that we are dealing with texts and images, as I have shown, are uh, clearly ideological. But what does that actually tell us about non-combatants? You know, I'm not saying that women and children or elderly men or injured men or non-fighting men could not contribute to the, to the defense of their towns. Of course they could. And we know from so many cases in history that even in contexts of war, those groups we call non-combatants actually can contribute in a way, sometimes even violently. But I think that this is not what was communicated here. I think that the composers of these texts and images didn't really care about what actually happened. They wanted to send some very clear messages about who is victorious, who is defeated. and and. How does this relate to uh, the reason of being defeated? The reason of you being defeated is because you're not a real man. You're not like us. You're not like Egyptian soldiers. And this is something which we actually have cross-culturally. So this is not something which we find only in Egypt. It is found in so many cultures when frame of war is, is um, using gender. Like one of the most recent examples was when the U.S. soldiers wrote on rockets, up yours. Um, and when you call your enemies cunts or pussies. So, yes, the banned language here involved, but it is actually demonstrating gender background. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, it's related to this um, answer to this discussion. And uh, Sara is here uh, watching us. Uh, so hi, Sara. Good to good to have you here. Uh, who is our? Uh, she's she's our. Um, boss we call in a very sweet way <laughs> so she's asking she she is asking if you could develop um a little bit about this comparative uh, perspectives so you mentioned uh contemporary uh, example from the us uh, sara is working with um the um, Roman society, and she was uh, studying uh, divorce and uh, very, you know, a patriarchal uh, system. Uh, so, if you could, maybe of course, uh, and I, I'm going to give an example which I didn't, of course, due to time constraint, manage to include into this lecture uh, concerning the Nubian or Meroitic data. There is, as I said. Uh, there are texts which are describing the conflict between Rome and Meroe in um, first uh, the end of the uh, first century uh, BC, beginning of the first century AD. So this whole period of Roman Egyptian conflicts. And um, what is interesting there is, first of all, that we have the Roman constructed perspective of Meroitic society and gender relations and rulership. And there, the ruler, female ruler of Meroe, is called not only Kandake, but a masculine, one eyed woman who is leading an army. And this is completely in contrast to the Roman gender norms. So we have, in a way, a uh, a transgression of norms ascribed to meritic society. And now an example, which is close to this writing of up yours on a, on a missile. Well, I didn't manage to, to mention it, but there are Roman ballista balls from Kassir Brim, which are from the Roman fort there, which as we know, played an important role in conflict between Rome and Meroe. And these ballista balls date from the time of this conflict. And on one of these balls, a missile, it is written, this is for you, Kandake. So we are dealing with a culture which is in different space in time, but which also had patriarchal norms and which followed very similar asymmetrical relations of power when genders are concerned and which used fairly similar metaphors. So if this is a rocket missile or a ballista missile, the message is clear, someone is shooting something at you. And then this leads me to another parallel. The word for ejaculation in ancient Egyptian is similar to the word for shooting. And it is even determ determined similarly. So there is, again, this idea of sex and violence being related. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, she, Sara is uh, adding the comment here on the chat because uh, she, she deals with adultery and sexual crimes. So if, if you want to comment something on that. Well, uh, adultery falls outside of the scope of this lecture um, and different authors in Egyptology dealt with it. Uh, adultery does not play a strong role in this war discourse. So what we know about adultery from ancient Egypt is one thing, but it does not play a role in the discourse of war. So it's not something which we have in texts kind of as these other metaphors, yes. But uh, it was something which, of course, they did not um, look upon with uh, approval. So. This is something we know from the, the rich corpus of Deir el-Medina texts on Ostraca, uh, 
that that adultery was not something which the society approved. Um, and what we know is that adultery is something which usually had to be settled by people themselves. It rarely went to the courts. So those examples which we have are only the extreme examples when the case actually reached the court. So all other examples, which were probably more numerous, were settled on a local level without involving the institutions. And it was settled based on patriarchal norms and rights. So we know also from literary texts that the proper way of dealing with adultery is to kill the adulterous man and the adulterous woman who are caught in the act. And in a way, these wisdom texts uh, are teaching these people what are the consequences of cheating? What are the consequences of uh, pursuing the pleasure with a married woman? And that these women who are seductresses are dangerous. So think about, for example, the tale of two brothers. She is a married woman, but she tries to seduce Bata. We also have the story from Papyrus Vestka, where again, a woman is conducting adultery. But this is something which was noticed by Lesko. None of these women are named and they all end up dead. So the idea which is being sent here to the text is don't be that woman, because if you do that, you will die and not even your name will be remembered. So th these, are, these are the ways the society dealt with potential uh, adulterous, adulterous behavior. And now I just uh, read uh, in a question a slot that about sexual crimes. Well, again, we do not have a lot of evidence. We have only few texts which concern sexual violence we interpret as rape. Uh, the problem is, first of all, that the verb neck, to have sex with or to penetrate someone, is something which is very ambiguous. It is not clear sometimes if there is the consent of both people or not. So maybe some cases of rape are actually overlooked because of the, the, the verb used, which has many connotations. Um, but we know from from uh, mythological texts that cases of rape uh, do not end up well. So the children born in rape are aborted. For example, we have this in the mythological papyrus from Delta, the mythological manual from Delta, where um, all of these rapes of uh, the female version of Horus, the Horit, and uh, end up uh, with uh, abortion. Yep. And uh, I can recommend uh, numerous articles of uh, Professor Alexander von Lieven, who dealt with these transgressions of norms uh, among the deities. Yeah, awesome. Uh, we have one more question uh, by Thais uh, as well. Um, do you think symbolic violence as well as physical violence could be more present in societies with greater conquering interest? And she's talking about between members of the, the same society. Uh -huh. So you, if I understood the question well, the more a society is interested in conquering, the more members of this very society are violent towards each other. Well, this makes sense, but for this we would need a cross-cultural study and it makes sense to me because competition with the, with the foreign other implicates competition within your own society. Because what is implicated here is who is going to take the spoils of war? How are they going to be distributed? There is an interesting book called Bioarchaeology of um, uh, Violence. And in some of these contributions, uh, several authors are dealing with societies from South America and Mesoamerica, and they are arguing that local women encouraged the taking of the prisoners of war because imprisoned women would take over their workload. 
So how about that? Uh, you know, we tend to polarize between, you know, women, non-combatants as victims of violence and only men being active. But what we are seeing here is that being a woman does not mean anything. There is always a difference between people in regards to ethnicity, status, friend or foe. So these women maybe did not go to war, but, you know, they encouraged it. They prepared the soldiers and so on and so forth. So, yes, the answer to your question would be, in my opinion, yes. But in order to make a generalization, we would need to do a, a, more, a more detailed study. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just, no, we have no more. Oh, Sara made a comment here. Uh... Yes, I know of this example. But uh, something like that uh, is not, at least in present in these texts I analyzed so far. I didn't, so far, so far I didn't find the use of the word for vagina as a, as a metaphor for a foreign soldier or as a bad word for a foreign soldier. Uh, we have a question by James Oakley. Uh, to what extent do the depictions of Nefertiti and T as female equivalents to the king help to infect gender uh, the king more explicitly as male by contrast and emphasize his masculinity qualities? It's interesting. It is, it is an excellent question and the answer is yes, because this is always a dialectical thing. So there is no, there is no only gendering on one and not the gendering of other. Gender is always a relation. So in this particular scenes, as I have shown, men, that is Egyptian kings, are depicted too, and they are smiting male enemies. So the whole idea is this balance of male-female in a way, just as male Egyptians are ruling over male foreigners, so do male female Egyptians rule over female foreigners. But my point was more that there is never a depiction of the king hurting a female foreigner. And why is that so? Let me remind you that you still, we have this already in the instructions for Meri Kare, and this continues into the Ramazan period. The king is supposed to be the father of the orphan and the, uh, the husband of the widow. So we have this ideal man who is not going to hurt a woman, even if she is a foreigner. Yeah. Um, oh, there is a... The follow-up question, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Would I answer? Definitely, yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the superiority of his masculine qualities. Surely, surely. It's it's interesting because uh, when you... Yeah, I always sorry. have to add... Sorry, I, I always have to add in this context. This is not something which we can now use and interpret all gender relations in ancient Egypt. This is in the context of war and violence. Yeah, and and just a, a follow up comment. Uh, I think what you're saying about the context is is very very important because sometimes we forget, as you were mentioning the the stila, uh, where this uh, evidence was displayed and to whom was intended. Uh, so we need to keep in mind this. Um, um, circulation of specific texts and images to to specific groups it's very distinct and we, we tend to um read these texts in their transcribed or translated form we tend to look at the glyphs and the the, the transliteration and to analyze the grammar but we do not think about the fact that this was on a stila and that this stila was somewhere. And even if it was in the temple, and even if not everyone could see it, some could. And this is why we should ask the question, okay, who could? And who could understand this? And who, whom did this text communicate with? Because it's not the same if you have a stila in the temple and a stila in a military fort, which is predominantly inhabited by men. I'm not saying there were no women and children there but predominantly inhabited by men. So no wonder that you have a text full of such metaphors 
and asymmetrical power relations between Egyptians and Nubians relying on gender asymmetrical power relations. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the materiality of the support is very is absolutely crucial. Uh, we I, I just remember something that we we came across last week in the discussion. Um, so we have one of our uh, colleagues, Fabricio, who is with us today. He's uh, working on the Satyricon, uh, and we were uh, by, by Petronius, and we were discussing how uh, complicated is the definition of rape. And and I and we were before we start this uh, lecture, you were saying how how difficult sometimes it is to write about such things uh, because we somehow uh, feel affected by what we are writing, and there is uh, this issue how we uh, take some distance from uh, studying violence. You know how this affects us um, and. Just, I just remember. I don't know if Fabrizio wants to uh, raise the question. We join. Yes, because <laughs> we we were talking about that. And the other thing, uh, Urosh, um, when you're talking about uh, following up on uh, what James just asked, um, I am remembering now the work of Isabella, who is in the backstage with us, because she's dealing with uh, women being as um, um, advisors in in war um, uh, scenes in, in, in Herodotus. So again, uh, these women, uh, they have names, so it's very different from what we have in the Egyptian source. They are named, they, are, uh, they belong to a very specific uh, elite group, uh, so they are free to circulate in this uh, social setting. Um, but this is not expected from all women uh, in Greece. So to which extent we can see this prescription uh, of how women should behave and how women shouldn't behave in, in texts because they are, they are intended to, to delete uh, mainly. You, you're absolutely right. We simply have to take care of the nuances. For example, for everyone in the audience who is interested, I can recommend the paper by Philip Tateaka who extensively dealt with hardship suit, and he also wrote a paper, I think, in one of the CRE volumes. I think it was exactly the CRE volume from Krakow. From 16, 2016. Yes. yes, and there he provides ample evidence of uh, hardship suit organizing military expeditions. So this idea we have that uh, a woman cannot uh, be a military leader is something which is contradicted by Egyptian texts. Of course, we should be careful how do we interpret these texts. You know, organizing a military expedition and sitting in Memphis or in Thebes is not the same as organizing a military expedition and actually going to the battlefield. And I think Philip even quotes one text which mentions that the soldier saw the King Hatshepsut on the battlefield. But, you know, these are very rhetorical texts. I would be careful about drawing conclusions from them. But simply giving as an, a food for thought that, yes, Egyptian women in high positions, such as Hatshepsut, as a ruling uh, female king, could also organize military expeditions. And another example we have is Ahotep, the mother of Ahmose, who is in one of the stila of Ahmose described as a woman who took care of the army. And uh, so, so she clearly had some role in the fight between the Theban kingdom and what I call the kingdom in the north, because I, 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 I don't want to use the word Hyksos because people tend to use the word Hyksos in a wrong way. They, they think Hyksos is a word for all people who lived in lower Egypt. Hyksos is the word for the ruling class, and there were not so many. So, I, uh, you know, by, by saying the kingdom of the north, I want to say that there were also Egyptians fighting against Egyptians in this war. This is a yeah. very important distinction to make. So, so they're so not that, peaceful <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah, this, 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 this idea of, you know, uh, Thebans versus the, the, the Hyksos, like Egyptian versus the Asiatic, I think we should abolish this. We have two kingdoms with different populations, 
one in Upper Egypt, the other one in Lower Egypt, and uh, different rulers, but you know they fighting. But this is another question. Now the point is, Ahotep was uh, playing an important role in the fight against this northerners. Yeah, and Isabella was just mentioning here uh, to us in the private chat uh, that Herodotus is showing the wives and the daughters of governors of Greek governors uh, acting in this uh, war uh, warfare. So giving advice, and she's reminding us the example of Artemisia, uh, who is uh, in charge of uh, the battlefield. So yeah. Uh, right, uh, so I, I don't think we have more questions uh, from the audience, so we can um, come to the end of our uh, talk today. And I would like to uh, thank you, Urosh, again for being with us, for, for providing uh, so much information, so much food for thought. Oh, okay, Sara, you, uh, you were entitled to... <laughs> uh, She's asking here, um, could you say a little about the use of the term patriarchy in Egyptology? Um, challenges and possibilities of the use of that concept. That's, that's a oh, big that's, question. That's an entire lecture, but uh, that's an entire lecture. But um, I am using this word simply in the lack of an appropriate word yet. And I'm very well aware that there are different forms of patriarchies in different cultures. But, you know, uh, closing eyes, turning heads and denying that this is a form of patriarchy is doing more damage than good. So, you know, definitely not the same form of a heteropatriarchy we have in modern Western societies but also not so different. So yeah, uh, let, me, let me say that you're absolutely right. This is something we should address. Um, and the way I use it, I use it as a form of patriarchy and not the patriarchy, which is the same everywhere because there are differences, of course. Yeah, uh, we will uh, have to keep this conversation on for sure. Um, in the, in the future. Uh, so uh, thank you everyone for uh, being with us. Uh, I would like to thank again um, um, Urosh for uh, providing this uh, fascinating lecture. Uh, a lot to think about, especially I have to say in the Brazilian context uh, where we have uh, huge evidence for violence against uh, women, like violence, uh, so we are also portrayed sometimes as a very uh, welcoming, friendly uh, society, but uh, our numbers um, regarding violence are extremely uh, disappointing, uh, especially um, with, you know, um, the LGBT EQ, uh, and it's something we need to address politically. And I think this type of uh, conversation we had today really highlights the importance of uh, studying ancient society and how the um, investigation of gender um, in the ancient world is really uh, fundamental for us to to think up to the world we are living in and how we can. Uh, suggest and act for uh, changes and improvements. So I think this is a very good way to conclude uh, the lecture series this year. And I would like to thank Urush again and to everyone involved uh, in this um, seminar and hope to see you very soon. Um, stay tuned in our social media and this lecture will be uh, available later on in our YouTube channel. So thank you, Urush. Uh, be well. Thank you very much for inviting me again. I was truly honored to be here tonight. Thank you. Very happy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks for being with us.